here we are. Before um, we kick things off and we potentially run into more muted audio situations, can one of you try talking for me so I can make sure that it's coming through? Hello and good afternoon. Okay, I think we're all green. Chat, yell at me if that's not the case, but it looks good on my end. So um, <laughs> man of the hour here, Damon Cortese, principal developer advocate here at AWS. Thank you so much for joining us. And as the title has said, as I have said quite a few times, we are here to talk about the very exciting launch of EMR Studio. Um, before we get into the launch and everything, A, thank you for joining us, and B, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about what you do here at AWS? Yeah, um, that's always a fun question, especially for uh, developer advocates, as we know. But um, yeah, my name is Damon, and I just jo rejoined uh, AWS, actually, back at the beginning of this year. And so uh, I've been on the EMR team, all told, about three years. I was a big data architect um, from about 2017 to, to 19, and essentially just helped all the um, EMR customers, you know, uh, prototype, architect, uh, build and eventually debug um, a lot of their you know big data deployments. And so these days, um, I'm doing something similar, but just more um, you know to to audiences at large and just helping folks understand uh, what is EMR, how do you use it, and what's all the stuff that you see in the left hand side of the console, and and why and when should you start things. So um, I've uh, I've always been uh, a data lover. I've been gathering data since I was a kid. Um, so I just uh. Huge fan of data, huge fan of analytics, and, and here I am today. <laughs> I'm going to uh, ask you to elaborate just what is EMR and what problem does it solve? Yeah, EMR um, goes back pretty far in AWS history. I, I looked this up this morning just to be sure, but uh, it was officially originally announced back in 2019, and it was a literal map reduce, or sorry, 2009, uh, a little bit further than 2019, um, but it was a literal map reduce system. And so you would tell EMR to spin up, you know, X number of mapper servers and X number of reducer servers and upload a Ruby script, and it would take care of, you know, doing all this big data Hadoop map reduce stuff for you. Um, it's evolved quite a bit since then, right? These days, it's a way to deploy different big data platforms on top of EC2, as well as on top of EKS, which is pretty cool. That's another new thing that um, we came out with at the end of last year. But it's, it makes it really, really easy for you to deploy uh, these different big data platforms. So if, you're, if you've heard of HBase or Spark or Hadoop or Hive, um, typically if you've run these in an on-premise situation, you'd have to you know, buy some servers, rack them, stack them, uh, plug in power, plug in network, all this kind of stuff. But with EMR, say you want to spin up a thousand node HBase cluster, you go into the EMR console, click a few buttons, say I want you know, a thousand uh, instances and click go and EMR takes care of provisioning those instances, deploying the software and deploying EMR software on top of that, which includes HBase as well as um, improvements to some of these different, uh, different open source big data platforms. 2009, that's incredible. If I remember correctly, that's the year that the iPhone 3G launched. <laughs> oh, Do you geez, remember yeah, a maybe. time when the iPhone was the same size as a credit card? <laughs> Fondly, that's how long yes. ago it was, right? I mean, if, if, assuming your data is assuming your data is good, that's a long time ago. Can you can you kind of take us a trip down memory lane? What was what was the landscape of big data problems twelve years ago versus what it is today? Both the problem and the solution. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. I, well, I think it was you know kind of around early two thousands, two thousand five, where all of a sudden we realized, or maybe it became more economical to say, you know what, we don't need one huge server to put all of our data in. We can actually take advantage of splitting data across many different servers. And so Google obviously you know pioneered this a lot, but also Yahoo um, pioneered this too. I believe Doug Cutting um, is is a is a person that was on the Yahoo team that helped create you know Hadoop and and Hive. But essentially we realized that hey. We can take our data, we can split it across all these different servers. And you know, the benefit of that is we keep the data close to um, the disk. You know, we keep the CPU close to the disk. And so when we run these um, you know, huge, huge, huge aggregations, um, we can do this in a distributed fashion. That was you know, the beginning of that. And then all these other big data platforms started coming out. I think uh, Facebook created Hive and um, Presto also came out of Facebook. Um, and HBase also became you know, very popular. And so all these different distributed um, computing platforms became, you know, I think just more economical for folks to use. But then what ended up happening is um, we just kept storing more and more data, right? So <laughs> um, it got to the point where it actually wasn't economical to store all this data on all these servers when you were only using a fraction of the CPU. And that's really where 
EMR came into play and S3 came into play too, right? You take all your data, you put it on S3. And if you want compute power, you can spin up, you know, a slice of compute power at the click of a button. So that's where EMR is really cool. Cause you're like, okay, great. I'm going to spin up a five node cluster to run a Spark job, or I'm going to spin up a thousand node cluster to run a persistent, you know, HBase uh, cluster. And, you know, upgrades are a lot easier and, and all that kind of stuff. I remember I used to maintain an HBase cluster um, back in 2012 and it was not fun. Um, especially if I had to do an upgrade, right? I'd have to get on the phone with the data center people, like, you know, pick up my iPhone 3G and be like, hey, uh, we need some new servers. And be like, great, that'll be three to six months, right? So um, I think that's, you know, just looking back in time, um, we've just evolved from, hey, we can put all this stuff on a distributed computing platform to, hey, we can actually separate storage and compute. And then, um, you know, eventually you get to that place where now um, you can deploy all these different types of software. You can run all sorts of different code, and it's just becoming easier and easier to maintain this. Um, so you know, data scientists don't have to <laughs> spend their day in the weeds anymore. Wait, wait, wait. You had an ops team that could rack and stack new capacity <laughs> in six months? I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> all I'm Obviously hearing take a lot longer, so I don't all I'm hey, hearing what? is there was a missed opportunity for 2006 or 2009 Amazon Prime to have been shipping servers to people that still weren't on <laughs> AWS yet. That, that's all I'm hearing now, but the PRFAQ doesn't let us go back in time, um, <laughs> unfortunately. But, you know, what I'm hearing here is, yeah. is you know, emblematic of, of a lot of trends, right? Like this idea that um, <laughs> scaling up works insofar as a lot of assumptions don't get violated. And I think that with as conservative of estimates as a lot of uh, you know distributed computing developers thought or you know even data center manage managers and, and, and everyone that, that managed that like the size and scale of, of, of data over time and the com necessary compute has just like increased exponentially in an unpredictable way um, and so you know like I, I see this if I had to categorize this like I see this also with with databases in certain scenarios but um, the option to just keep scaling up and making that single box even bigger just isn't always an option, nonetheless making it cost effective. And so, you know, seeing this with, with um, you know, parallelized computing uh, pl platforms and frameworks that you described before, um, certainly so, but I think that's like one of the main value propositions of moving to cloud, right? The ability to have uh, infinite horizontal scalability so long as you design your applications and use frameworks that support that paradigm um, is, a, is a real boon. And especially to be able to use some of those known frameworks and bindings for your applications and processing jobs, but now backed by something like a managed service in e Amazon EMR, that sort of removed, I would imagine, removed a lot of the, the fear of like, oh no, will we have to switch processing frameworks and, and our entire infrastructure plan as you know the future is just unpredictable at a certain point, right? Just living in fear of that. Um, but it sounds like EMR really the the value proposition as as you've described is um, bring your you know it's not just MapReduce it's a number of other batch processing or parallel processing compute jobs and the EMR will help manage to orchestrate and deliver those jobs backed by the rock solid EC or Amazon or AWS infrastructure. Sorry, I'm tripping over all my words today. <laughs> yeah, no, you're you're totally right, right? Um, and I think it's 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 still changing and and um, you know improving too, right? Uh, EMR has typically been deployed onto EC2, and so you'd go in there, you'd select your instance type, and say, yeah, of course I want my you know R5 24XLs today because I've got a really big uh, training model or something like that. But what's also happening is you know Kubernetes is becoming more important, and a lot of folks are trying to deploy stuff on EKS too to help optimize their cost even more to help you know um, make better use of their resources. And so that's another direction that uh, EMR is going is to plan an EKS. That's a little bit outside of um, Studio, of course, though. So I won't I won't dive too deep onto that. Yeah. So yeah, I, um, as you guys were chatting, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to move along. So if you were going to say something, go right ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to um, uh, add another uh, context to that that data point. You know, we were talking about what it was like in 2009 versus what it's like this year. I just pulled up a stat. It says that um, in 2009, we had between one to two, a total of one to two zettabytes of data generated across the entire internet. Uh, Damon, as our guest of honor, do you want to take a guess how many, how many uh, zettabytes we're generating in 2021? I would say at least 100. At least 100. Okay, that's pretty close. I think it's somewhere between like 60 and 70. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. 
So, so I, that, that, that's, but that, that kind of really puts things into perspective, right? In 12 years, we have what, like a 60X increase in the just sheer volume of data generated. And, and I, wanted, I want to take us out of the realm of the abstract because I think we, you know, because the Zetabyte is what? It's like, a, it's like 1 billion terabytes. So this yeah. is not a number that, you, that, that we're good at dealing with. So let's get down <laughs> to earth. Can you give us an example of, you know, I, I know we talk about big data problems and I've always seen jokes of like, like if, it, if it fits on your, your USB drive, then it, that's not big data. But, but just can you give us a couple of real world concrete examples where this data has exploded? Is it, is it analytics data? Is it sales data? Like just what is the problem and what is the customer going through when they hit that scaling wall and they need to reach for a tool like EMR? Yeah, yeah, no, certainly. I mean, there's there's so many different use cases for that, right? I mean, I could I could pick up my phone right now, and that'll generate what seven to ten data points that get sent to you know, my phone provider almost immediately, right? So there's all this data that is constantly streaming up. So um, a lot of it is analytics data to help make products better. Every single app you use, that's you know almost certainly sending back data every time you visit a website. Um, you know, all the email you read. So there, there's just all sorts of different use cases. But I think what's happening as well is. Um, the ability to use the data is just becoming more pervasive. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm based out of Seattle and there's several startups here in Seattle and there's a few that when a new employee starts um, as part of their, you know, onboarding, they learn how to write SQL because they, they've got a data warehouse there. Um, they've got all the data from, you know, the time that the company was invented to now, and, you know, maybe even seconds ago if it's real-time data. And they're trying to let everybody use that data to make better decisions in their jobs. So kind of regardless of what, you um, what domain you're thinking about, there's all this data, right? If you're in marketing, um, there's email metrics and delivery metrics and all this kind of stuff. And you're, if you're in sales, right, the data might be a little bit slower, but there's all sorts of new startups coming on around like um, sales data and how to make people more effective there. And then if you're in product and engineering too, right, you're going to use this data to help make your product better. And that might be you know, taking feedback from from customers, or it might be, you know, um, part of your product where you make, you know, help your customers make better decisions or things like that based on the data that you're pulling in. So I think that's the that's the big thing. It's not just that there's more data; it's that there's more people using it and more different use cases too. And I think that's that's really key when it comes to this because all of a sudden it's becoming more and more accessible. And if everybody at the company can run a SQL query and can dive in and see what's happening, um, you're, you find that people are going to do that more often, right? And so I think that's, that's what's happening. It's not just like a once a month you know, financial analysis, it's somebody you know, clocking in on Tuesday morning and saying, okay, like, what am I gonna focus on first today? Let me go run that quick query and, and get back that information. So I think that's, that's a huge part of it too. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I've just been sitting here thinking back to when I was uh, at an event in college and it was, uh, you know, like a, there was a large data set that was provided to the group. It was kind of like a hackathon. And the idea was to like to derive insights from this. And there was one poor, unfortunate soul from central IT who was there to help onboard every single team at the event to find out ways to like securely give them temporary and shared access to like a spark cluster that was managed on-prem at the university and just like you know I, you're laughing but it's just like you know that was totally normal not very long ago and and you know um, as long as you could keep that utilization in, in a realm that made the dollars and cents make sense it, you know it was there but as hardware changes and evolves as the scale of some of these um, problems and and some of the data we use to solve them just uh, increases exponentially the the need to be able to have that elasticity and that on-demand payment model from uh from cloud like aws makes that immensely valuable um so we're here to talk about emr studio in particular right i know the, the context on emr and the the, the yep. landscape here is immensely valuable um but what i have heard so far and I'm, you're here to dispel any any misconceptions i have but also to uh talk about all the things that i certainly don't know is um when we think about something like a distributed distributed data problems or parallel uh, computing across some of these these massive data stores, um, that certainly doesn't ring like, hey, this is easy to get started with, right? Or it's e easy to 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 share this processing environment in the same way that we were, you know, I was giving that example from a college hackathon. Um, what is EMR Studio? And and I know it helps to certainly make this easier, more accessible for folks. Um, but why don't you, as the expert, give us the the, the full overview here. Yeah, yeah, certainly, I'd love to. So um, to begin with, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about EMR and, and what that has looked like 
um, just for folks to get in there and start EMR. Um, and so typically, if you want to start an EMR cluster, you you know you log into the, the AWS console, you go into the EMR section, you start a cluster, and it's like, okay, cool, pick this instance type, um, pick this security group, pick this subnet. Um, what applications do you want to deploy on there? Do you want Hive or Presto or, or you know Spark or Zeppelin or whatever, right? There's I think there's um, 20 or so different open source frameworks you can deploy. And then you have to go in and configure it and add your tags, and then and then then you get the cluster up, right? And so then you got to SSH into the cluster. Uh, you got to configure it, maybe if you're doing some some certain stuff, right? And so it's it's an intensive process, right? Like it it's not for the faint of heart, and it can be pretty tough to to get up and running. You have to really be a data engineer or you know software engineer that's really um, you know invested in these different platforms. And so what we've seen is. Uh, and this is not specific to, to EMR, but this is across, you know, technology in general is people just want to get started, right? Like they just want to be able to go in there. They want to be able to run their SQL query and they want to get back to their day job. They don't want to have to muck around in Etsy, Conf or, you know, whatever on some some Linux machine. They just want to get in there and get up and running. And, you know, data science has become increasingly important um, in, in the world in general. But I think the other trend we're seeing is just data analysis is becoming more important as well, right? I think there's been a trend lately where um, data engineering is harder to, to hire for than data scientists now. And you know, part of that is all the, the training and education that's happened around um, data science. But part of it too is, is just the ability to get in there and, and run some queries. It's becoming much, much easier. So once you've built that solid foundation, what folks want is the ability to just kind of hop in there do their work, share their work, and and get back out, right? And that's really where EMR Studio has started to um, to really shine. Is it's a way for folks um, that are not necessarily engineers, but you know, analysts or data scientists, to go in there, start up a Jupyter notebook, run their code, save it, save it in the cloud. Um, and then even share it, right? They can connect it to GitHub. They can push changes from EMR Studio to GitHub. And um, the other thing that I, I do want to call out is it's integrated with AWS SSO. So you don't even need an you know, IAM account. You don't even need an AWS account you, to log into Studio. You can connect it to your, um, your corporate Active Directory or your corporate um, directory provider to log in as a regular user. And so the management of the users is kind of baked into EMR Studio. You can log in using that, and it just makes it, a lot easier both from an administrative perspective but also from a customer perspective to kind of get in there and and do your job so um i kind of rambled on for a little bit but i think that <laughs> kind of gives a good overview as to you know where where the genesis of it came from yeah definitely i think you said the the word i fear most in there which is subnet All right, that nothing makes me sweatier <laughs> than trying to pick a subnet for my service to deploy into those are hours that i'll never get back um <laughs> when a machine can't see another machine and I have to go and debug that, that networking. And I think this is a case of uh, Nick's favorite word, which I'm sure he'll say in just a moment. Um, but, but before, but let's make Nick suffer and see how long can, we can hold off on saying the word. Uh, but you, you mentioned auth and SSO. Is this, is, are you talking about infrastructure permissions or are you talking about data permissions or is it both? So on the, the auth and SSO side, it is, um infrastructure permissions. So granting somebody the ability to log into EMR Studio. There is another layer of permissions in there too, which is you can decide if folks can attach directly to existing clusters or if they can create their own clusters. Um, so that's one other level there, but that's definitely more infrastructure permissions. Um, data permissions is something you know we definitely care deeply about on the EMR side. We've done a lot of work there in the past uh, couple of years to um, make it easier to give fine-grained access in EMR, and that's you know certainly on the roadmap for EMR Studio. But right now, a lot of it's just focused around the the infrastructure permissions. Yeah, and and I think um, really what this sounds like to me, I know a lot of the time we talk about the, the ability to have on-demand infrastructure is about making sure you have the compute or the storage when you need it, and not much longer, and being able to pay for just what you're using when you want to use it. And I think that what's really clear here with this permissions model is that previously, you know, this would all get pushed off into another layer. Like these permissions had to exist, right? Like you had to, you had folks that you wanted to access the data or run jobs, but you didn't necessarily want them to be able to um, delegate how much of the overall cluster they would have access to, right? So this idea of like boundaries of permissions, I know it can sound like there's a lot, but it always existed. And it's, it's really about how, how you right size that, right? Um, and it sounds like EMR Studio makes that significantly easier. But um, as, as Rob teased me before, uh, we're going to talk a little bit here about my favorite term on this show, which is undifferentiated heavy lifting. 
I, I feel like I need like a like a voice <laughs> extension that when it hears it, there's just like fireworks and uh, like little flames that pop up and like a cash register sound and like money starts flowing from the bottom or or from the top of the screen. But um, one like of those Twitch bots, you know, or one of those signs in the back that's like minutes since Nick has said un not said undifferentiated have lifting. Yeah, that would. <laughs> I don't think we'd make an episode. I don't think we've since this is like I don't know second season halfway through the season we have not gone a single episode without me saying that term. So um, you know, I'm not stopping now. The show keeps rolling. But like, yeah, I I think the the biggest the biggest discrepancy that I see is that there is a whole host of infrastructure level permissions around administrating and um, delegating compute space to users and management of clusters or, or you know, even super units of that infrastructure. And then the ability to simply say, I have a SQL query that I want to run and I just want it to be executed. And like these could not be further apart with that, without this huge like chasm in between them. And what you were describing before is essentially folks had to, just to run that SQL query, learn so much of this upstream knowledge just to learn that, right? The, those folks that just want to run a SQL query are often not going to be uh, tinkering with the performance characteristics and configuration of their cluster. They're not typically going to be using like a profiler to try and understand exactly like what their 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 resource allocation and utilization is, right? A and so what this really sounds like to me is it says, hey, that's undifferentiated heavy lifting. And a service like EMR and especially EMR Studio just removes all of that overhead, that unnecessary, unnecessary, non-value providing overhead and helps the people get value out of the stuff that matters the most, which is the SQL queries that they craft. And to do so with principles of least permission and so on and so forth, so that you're not accidentally, um, or in a best case scenario, spending a lot of time making sure you're not giving away the keys to the castle um, to the wrong people. Yeah, yeah. And I'll say a few things to that too. I think there's there's a few important things to mention um, with respect to you know, EMR Studio. Um, one is there is this ability in EMR Studio to have cluster templates. So um, I don't know if folks out there are familiar with Service Catalog, but this is a way to like provision new um, apps or templates inside your organization. And so EMR Studio does integrate with cluster, um, Service Catalog. And so if somebody's gone to the, the hard work of creating a cloud formation template that spins up a, a maybe a data science specific cluster or you know some specific cluster that can auto scale and they've already done all the hard work, it makes it really easy for somebody in EMR Studio to say, cool, I want that cluster template right there and I'll spin that up. Um, so that's one aspect of it. From the, the permissions thing, you know, uh, with lake formation, um, that's been a big push the past few years to you know, try to ensure both row and column level data access permissions on data that lives in S3, right? So that's not integrated with EMR Studio, but it's, it's certainly on the roadmap. Um, same with Apache Ranger, that's um, you know, sub, uh, supported on, on EMR today. And that is pretty commonly used in different organizations to manage you know, um, fine-grained access permissions. So I think that's definitely one of the challenges. There's a ton of open source projects to do this as well, but you know, folks need a good way to integrate that into their organization and it's pretty hard to do that. Yeah, well, one of the things you touched on earlier, maybe we can tell me a little bit more is uh, Kubernetes. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that there are a lot of customers out there, especially enterprise customers, and enterprise customers tend to correlate with larger data sets. Um, they're running massive uh, Kubernetes clusters, EKS clusters. Uh, you had mentioned that there's some sort of integration between EMR Studio and EKS. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll touch on the, the EMR and EKS uh, support um, really quickly. So essentially, you know, back in December, we announced EMR and EKS, so you can deploy and run jobs on EKS. Um, I had never really touched Kubernetes before January, um, so I'm very much a noob at this. But uh, for me to get up and running on EMR and EKS, once I got, you know, the proper IAM roles and all that stuff set up, it was, you know, one command in my command line to say, edit AWS EMR containers, start job run, and I was done. Like, it sent that over to the you know EKS cluster, ran the job, monitored the job, spit logs out into Cloud CloudWatch and S3. And it even gives you this really nice um, Spark History Server UI that you can pop open when whether the job is running or it's not running. So if you need to kind of debug the job or see what happened, you can go in there and do that. Um, with EMR Studio, it ties directly into that. So with Studio, you can connect to EMR on EC2 clusters. And so these are you know, standard EMR clusters that you spun up. Or if you do have an EMR and EKS virtual cluster started, you can connect to that virtual cluster too. And you can run, um, you can run your notebooks on Kubernetes, uh, but you can also go down your list of jobs and you can um, launch your, your um, 
Spark history server inside of EMR Studio as well. So you can go in there, you can look at your jobs, you can you know debug them directly from Studio. And again, you don't need any sort of AWS console access to do this, which I think is the, the huge difference from just standard EMR, right? Um, when you used to have to debug EMR before, you'd, you'd have to SSH into the, the, the you know primary node, do some port forwarding, make sure you had all your VPCs set up, all that kind of fun stuff. And then you could access the, uh, the history server. But now we just have these off cluster consoles. And so EMR Studio makes that really easy. You just get your list of EMR and EKS clusters, your list of jobs, and you can go ahead and, and hop into those and debug straight from Studio. So it makes it a lot easier. Uh, we've got a question coming in chat uh, as we've been talking. Mar Pontes says, uh, how does a Spark job that would run over a templated EMR cluster compare to a uh, glue Spark job? And what are the trade-offs? And, and I'm kind of combining what he, his initial question with his later clarification. So does that question make sense? Um, I think so, yeah. So, you know, glue is certainly um, a way to run Spark jobs on, on AWS as well. And it abstracts things um, even a little bit more. With a glue job, you just kind of submit your PySpark code or your Spark Scala code. And you know, Glue gives you a really easy way to say, I, I want to run it on, you know, uh, I forget a, a certain number of DPUs, right, data processing units. And so Glue also has additional um, functionality on top of Spark. So Spark has data frames, and Glue has, I think they're called dynamic frames. Um, but it allows you to be a lot more flexible with the data, and can even add, you know, more performance to processing the data and stuff like that. So, um, you know, Glue is is a great system if you just want to like spin up a Spark job, run it, and not have to worry about any of the infrastructure at all. Um, you know, EMR Studio is also a good way to do that too. I think the main difference between you know Glue and EMR is your, you know, with Glue, it allows you to submit those things really easily. Um, and you just run that job and you get some, some metrics out, but you, know, you don't really have to worry about a lot of the underpinnings of Spark. With EMR, you have full control to worry about the underpinnings. So if you, if you do want to worry about them and you do want to go in there and you want to tweak and tune either those nodes or you need to add you know, custom software to those, those nodes, you can do that using you know, Spark on EMR too. So it um, gives you that additional level of power and flexibility if you, if you do need to dive in that deep. Awesome. Yeah, uh, great answer. Uh, we actually had one question from LinkedIn Live as well. Um, you know, we talked before about there being so many different customers that are on EMR. Uh, someone was interested in knowing if there are any from the healthcare industry. And, you know, I, the example I named before was with a healthcare data set. So, you know, at a hackathon using uh, <laughs> parallel compute clusters to do MapReduce on that. I'm imagining there's certainly a few that you've spoken to at least. Uh, but are there any details you want to share yeah. there? Yeah, um, I, I don't have any off the top of my head, but we do certainly have um, you know, a lot of healthcare providers that are using EMR for their, their data processing needs. That's, that's, of course, one of the great benefits of uh, AWS in general is the various security compliance. So there's a lot of um, HIPAA compliance that is built into EMR, um, especially you know, from the, the user access point of view. Um, yeah, like I said, I don't think I have any specific examples off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. um, you know, EMR is in use across pretty much every industry. <laughs> um, and so, you know, if you're going to process data, um, it, it's one of the, the, you know, one of the best ways to do it for sure is the ability to kind of spin up those clusters. And again, it could be a Spark job, it could be um, Presto, it could be Trino, it could be HBase. So I think, you know, just the availability of all these different open source frameworks on EMR makes it a really popular option to both evaluate and and put into production um, your, your data analysis, right? Because everybody's got um, a different approach or a different set of requirements. And I think that's where EMR is, is really flexible. You had talked earlier about uh, some of these access patterns with uh, SSO and auth and the types of workloads. We talked a little bit about the history of these workloads. Uh, today, can you kind of walk us through what are the common life cycles of an EMR cluster? Do you see patterns showing up here and there? Um, maybe you can walk us through that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's definitely a few common patterns. I think um, probably one, one of the most common ones is a long running cluster that's shared between you know, multiple people in the same company. And so this kind of mirrors the on-premise Hadoop Hive environment where you spin up a cluster, um, people connect to it, they run their jobs and the, those, those jobs are shared across the entire cluster, right? 
Um, that's one of the things we put a lot of effort into with EMR is the ability to kind of auto automatically manage those clusters for you. Because what happens is, you know, people come in at 8 a.m., they start running their workloads, and all of a sudden you need a ton of capacity. And uh, I think it was last year we came out with EMR managed auto scaling, which, you know, you give it a cluster and we'll keep an eye on that cluster for you. And based on the workloads, kind of resize it dynamically throughout the day. And you can, of course, you know, scale it down manually or scale it back up. Um, but that long running cluster that that is shared across the organization is definitely one of the one of the more common ways to do it. I'd say probably the other most common way is um, ephemeral jobs. So if you want to and usually this is part of like a data pipeline or something, but you might have a job that you want to run once a day or once every hour or something like that. It's not unusual to have that as part of an Apache Airflow orchestration that actually spins up an EMR cluster just for that job, submits the job to that cluster, and then spins it back down. And that's kind of like the, the best case scenario there, just in terms of optimizing your resources, right? Like. You get a cluster, you know exactly how big you want it to be. You can dedicate that entire job to it and you get the, the best cost and performance benefit from kind of running that that job just on that cluster. Um, and then I think the, the other use case I'll mention are, is these like long running static um, clusters. And that's stuff like Presto or HBase where you have a pretty well-defined amount of capacity that you want to use and you spin up that cluster and it, you know, you might run that cluster for a year or, or longer or what have you, right? Um, but again, that's one of the benefits of EMR, especially with something like HBase, like we added HBase on S3 support. So you can spin up an HBase cluster of two nodes or a thousand nodes, but all the data can still live on S3. And you can even have like multiple read-only HBase clusters that are reading from that same data on S3. So just the, the way the different, you know, conventions you can put together um, is is pretty impressive. But those are definitely the three most common uh, cluster life cycles. And I think the other thing I want to mention there is we, we, we always we keep talking about clusters, right? So you've got an EMR cluster and, and that's how we've we've thought about it. Well with EMR on EKS, it's definitely more of a job centric thing, right? So you submit a job to EMR and EKS, that you know EKS cluster gets your resources from from the pool, runs that job and, and spins those back down. You know, it's all container based of course, right? And so uh, the other thing to note about that is like with a long running cluster, the permissions are kind of assigned to the cluster. And yes, we do have, um, you know, fine grained permissions with lake formation, but on the EMR and EKS side, the permissions are kind of assigned to the job. Um, and so that's something that is a big, um, definitely a big shift just in terms of how folks are running um, their jobs on these different systems. So um, yeah, I think that, I think that covers everything. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, talking to some of those common patterns that you've seen, like I used to do a lot of more hands-on work with AI and machine learning, and uh, it was often common to have some nightly batch processing job that someone would, would orchestrate with EMR, um, but that only runs once a night, and you know, oftentimes it's, it's chosen to run overnight because you have more time sensitivity, right? You can afford the cost of the, the minutes for a cluster to spin up because no one's sitting there waiting for it to finish. Um, but on the other hand, throughout the day, when a lot of people may be making ad hoc queries um, or, or need results uh, sort of more immediately, um, having that persisted cluster that's already there is, is more ideal. So you kind of figure out what your steady state is and you keep that provisioned and then you have the ability with some cost sensitivity or, or time sensitivity to spin up an entirely new cluster as needed. Um, and, and again, sort of best of both worlds there, as you described, you could have a persistent persisted cluster with auto scaling such that you can set constraints on the maximum and minimum size of the cluster I'd imagine um, and be able to sort of get both of those scenarios if uh, you know if that if that's something that's uh, either a hard to nail down what your steady state requirement is um, or you want to just consolidate and put everything under one cluster yeah exactly well uh, we've been talking about EMR studio for a while. I wonder if we can get a hands-on tour of it. I think we probably can. <laughs> awesome. I'd love to hear it. And I'm sure chat will be very excited to see this as well. Sweet. Yeah, well, uh, Damon is setting that up. Uh, chat, we're, we're trying to get as many of your questions answered as possible. We've been diligently following along. So thank you for all of that. And uh, if EMR Studio looks anything like many of the other studio flavors of applications I have seen across AWS, I'm very excited because yes, I can use APIs in a CLI, but sometimes just a few clicks just gets you there quicker. Um, so I'm excited to see this. <laughs> yep. right, I've got my, my screen ready to go. 
All right, we ready to hop into the, the demo? Yep, you're good. You're coming out loud and clear. Sweet. All right. So uh, this is the EMR Studio uh, you know, console inside of the AWS console. So one thing to note about uh, Studio, before you set it up, there's a couple requirements. One, uh, you do need to have AWS SSO set up in your AWS account, and you can just add some you know, standard users and groups in there, or you can connect it to Active Directory. And then there's a set of uh, policies that you need in place in order to kind of grant access to EMR Studio. We do have a blog post coming out soon with some of these um, uh, some of these definitions, but that'll just be a cloud formation stack. You can see here, I've got some you know, basic, advanced, and intermediate user policies. But let's get started with EMR Studio. So if you're familiar with EMR, there's the left-hand side um, dialog with all our clusters and notebooks and all that kind of fun stuff. But you just go in here and click Get Started. And what that does, like, this is still on the console, but it does a quick check to make sure you've got everything ready to um, get EMR Studio set up. So there's the AWS SSO check. I mentioned earlier there's service catalog integration, so you can actually create templates inside of service catalog that um, people in EMR Studio can then use to launch EMR clusters. And then you just go ahead and click Create Studio. So you give your studio a name. I'll call this the Court Studio. And um, you do have to select the roles in S3 bucket. This is a one-time setup when you're going through here. And so I'm just going to select the EMR Studio service role. EMR Studio user role, and I need an S3 bucket where I'm going to put my all my notebooks. And so that just goes in there. And next, I'm, I am going to have to select a subnet as part of this, um, but I'm just going to go in there and select all of them. So we don't have to worry about it too much. Quick, quick Rob, <laughs> this close is just your eyes. where um, if somebody's launching. <laughs> But yeah, if somebody's launching um, an EMR cluster from Studio, it, it needs somewhere to go. So you just need to define that. And then you can pick um, your security groups that you want to use. And I have some that I already pre-built. So I'm just going to select a security group for my um, Studio Engine and Studio Workspace. And again, this is a one-time setup. So once you get this Studio created, you don't need to go back and um, go to this level of detail. So you go ahead create your studio and there we go. Now I've got the court studio and up here there's a link to add users to the studio. So all the user management can happen in the studio too, which is pretty nice. Um, we've got all the settings up there. I unfortunately in this SSO um, forgot to add my, my own user account. Oh, there we go. Um, so I can add my own user account there. Awesome, and then that adds me as an administrator, but you can also assign different policies in there too. So I can assign, I have a bunch of EMR Studio policies for basic, intermediate, and user access. So what does that actually mean? Well, if I go back to my studio here and let's click on that Studio Access URL, so that's gonna go ahead and spin up the Studio Access. And this is kind of the off cluster or off console experience. So I'm coming in here as a user, um, as my Decort user, and let's see if I'm already signed in. I don't think I'm already signed in, so you, I might have to do that really quickly. So I'll go ahead, sign into Studio, and uh, let's pop in my password there. Oops, not my, uh, you probably don't want my AAA password. Let's see here. <laughs> uh, there we go. All right. <laughs> Good old one password. Hopefully I didn't show you too many of my, my secret passwords. Um, but yeah, so that gets me signed into Studio. So this is, again, um, completely non-IAM user. Now I'm signed into my console, and here's where I can go ahead and create a workbook. Before I do that, on the left-hand side, let me zoom in again. You've got your different clusters over here. So there's EMR and EC2. Um, you can go in here, manage your clusters. Again, this is a much simpler interface than um, inside of the EMR console itself. And the other cool thing, I don't have any clusters in this account running right now, but you can launch your application UIs directly from here. So whether that's the Spark History server, the Yarn server, you just go in here, click launch, and you're good to go. Um, and that spins up another thing that you just kind of pop into. Um, the EMR and EKS I'll show in a second, but if I had any EKS clusters in this account, you'd see them there and I could go and list my jobs there. But let's go back to the dashboard and let's create a workspace. So I go in here, I say my notebooks, select whatever subnet I want. And this is where the different user permissions come in. So if I have a basic user policy, I can only attach to an existing EMR cluster. If I have an intermediate, I can use cluster templates. So I can go in here and pick different cluster templates that I might want to spin up. And then I can also just create an EMR cluster from scratch. And so if you've ever created an EMR cluster before, you'll notice there's about 90% fewer dialog boxes in EMR Studio than in the regular EMR console. So you just name your cluster, select the release you want, and um, spin that up, and, and that's it. So 
I've already gone ahead and created a workspace on a different account. So let me just switch over to there. And what we'll see, there's my big data studio. You can see there's my workspace there. I created a maps workspace and connected it to a cluster. Um, I'll look at the EMR and EKS stuff really quickly because on this one, I do have some EKS clusters. So let's do that and hop into that EMR cluster. And again, this is where you can see all my different jobs that are running. So this goes and talks to EMR and EKS. I've got a scheduled job that just keeps going through there, um, but I can look in there and I can launch the Spark History server from there too. So um, I can go through and do that for running jobs, completed jobs, and it's all integrated into Studio, which is awesome. So let me go back to my dashboard and my workspaces and I'll launch this Maps workspace. And this jumps me directly into a Jupyter Lab environment. And so when you launch um, you know, EMR Studio and you launch your workspace, you're dropped into this EMR Studio environment. You can create brand new notebooks with Python 3, PySpark, Spark, or Spark R. Um, we also have these notebook examples down here, which I find ridiculously useful because I always like seeing how other folks did things. And if you click on that, this gives you a whole bunch of different examples that you can use. So let's say I want to look, I want to use pandas and matplotlib. I can just double click that, pop it open, save it to my workspace, and then I can go through and I can run this um, run this notebook example right away. And so that is taking a second to open. I'm just going to go ahead, go over here, hit run, and I am a data scientist now. Hooray! <laughs> just kidding. I mean, no no offense to data scientists out there um, who are way way smarter than I am. Um, but now I've got this awesome notebook. It went through, it ran. You can see generating plots and all that kind of stuff. So we've got some examples out there. Those live in GitHub. Um, and so you can go out there, you could download those directly from GitHub. And that is pretty much everything I wanted to, to touch on um, just in terms of EMR Studio. The only other thing I'll touch on super quick is there is GitHub integration directly in the studio. So if I click over here on this Git repository, you can add a new repository. So you can connect directly to a public repo or and, and then connect that and clone the, the code directly into EMR Studio and that'll show up in your file browser. So. Um, so, so easy to, to get started. Um, I think, you know, that might be, we're kind of at the top of the hour. So I don't know if we, if we uh, need to, uh, need to pull back. <laughs> oh, no, we have a little bit of time. I mean, this is, this is so great. I, you know, for folks that may have worked with notebooks before, again, some of the data science folks, uh, they're probably very familiar with this format, but, um, to even a lot of other application or web devs, the, the notebook sort of environment as like a IDE slash runtime where you execute code. It's probably a little foreign. Um, I saw at the top there, you didn't have code. You had a bunch of like notes added in there that were um, formatted and stylized with markdown. Could we just give a really basic overview of what this notebook is and how that relates necessarily to the EMR job that would be run under the hood? Because they're because they're separate. And I yeah. know sometimes this scares a lot of folks away, even if they knew how to write SQL. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So. Um, with the Jupyter Notebooks, every time you launch a Jupyter Notebook, it's connected to a kernel somewhere. Um, and this, you can kind of think of it like a Linux kernel, but it's essentially where um, your, the code is going to run. And so you can see up here in the top right, um, I'm connected to this like Python 3 kernel. So that means I can run Python code. If I wanted to, I could switch this to PySpark or Spark R. Um, so I can use different kernels with the notebook, right? And the notebook, you can think of it like a, a handwritten notebook. You can write down your notes. Oops, got a little failure to connect there, no worries. Um, you can write down your notes and you can format them. So this is all marked down here. Um, and so you can write your notes there. And when you hit you know, run that cell, it just converts it to markdown. Now, the cool thing with, um, with notebooks, let me go ahead and just add a new cell. I can change this to from you know, raw markdown and code. So if I put code in there and I'm connected to my Python 3 kernel, I can just write whatever Python code I want to. And when I hit run, that goes ahead and runs on the back end. So right now, if I go to my um, EMR clusters over here, I'm attached to an EMR cluster on EC2. And what that means is the Jupyter Notebook is connected to Livy, which is a an interface for connecting to that, that um, EMR cluster, well, just uh, clusters in general. And so the the notebook connects to Livy and tells Livy to run stuff on that cluster. So when I hit, you know, run here, that's communicating with the cluster, running that Python code and getting the results back. And I can do that with EC2 clusters or EKS clusters. So um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty sweet because you can do, you know, plotting and all kinds of different stuff. And the nice thing about it too is 
like you can all these cells are connected. So if I define a variable here, I can use that you know, later on, but I can also add nice you know, formatting and heading between the different cells. So I can actually tell what's going on and it's not just a bunch of code. Um, so I think that's where notebooks have become really nice because this is, this is something where you could print this out if you really wanted to um, and bring it into a meeting and be like, hey, here's all my analysis. And that's great because the analysis lives with the the description of it, which I think is why notebooks have become so popular. Um, the other thing I'm going to call out that is really, really interesting, and I haven't done this a lot. Um, I don't think I have a cell here where I can do this, but um, you can actually run these notebooks as part of data pipelines. There's an open source project out there called Papermill, um, and that you know if you wanted to play out play around with it, you could do that. But you can take this notebook here that's in your EMR Studio, submit an AWS EMR command line. And then run this notebook through, um, run this notebook through on, on the EMR backend, and you can actually parameterize different cells. So if I click over here, and under Advanced Tools, I could add um, a tags here, and I forget the exact format, but um, I think I can I can just add like a parameters tag, and then what I can do is I can save that, and I can run this notebook through, and I can say, okay, I'm going to specify a different um, value. Uh, for part of this cell, and then it like runs through that notebook with that with that updated variable. So that kind of blows me away. So I'm like, I can run a notebook as as a data pipeline. Awesome, <laughs> um, but we're seeing that as a pretty like common use case. <laughs> I mean, I, what I'm hearing here is gone are the days of APIs. Look out, GraphQL. We've got notebooks as an <laughs> API here, and that's that's all people really need, right? No, but <laughs> joking aside, I, I think you know you hit on the you hit on the topic I wanted to touch on, which was just the aggregation of the multiple parts and entities that are all needed when performing this type of work. Like you kind of have in my eyes three pieces here. You have the standard operating procedure and any sort of documentation around what this processing job is and and the the analysis and all of that. So that's one. Second, as long as you're not processing the data locally, you have some code that has to call out to an orchestrator that lives elsewhere and then you have that like you know either an on-premises cluster or or you know your emr cluster so you have these three different entities and you know just having those be separated has so many gaps for how people can can you know out of no bad will accidentally misuse them or, or just like increase the friction for using this and what i see here in this notebook is you 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 bring together in emr studio the instructions in the standard operating procedure the analysis um, you have the code that will, um, you know, perform some of the pre-processing here, but also just any of the the jobs that are being executed on EMR are being launched directly from here. So, you know, the idea of this being a one-stop shop is not facetious. It, it, it is really bringing together all the entities that people day-to-day -day need, but instead of having the SOP in a notebook or a Word document and, you know, their data elsewhere that they have to go fetch and query for and, and the images, like, it's just all in one place. And I think that that reduces much more friction. It, it may not be very clear to folks that, that don't use this on a day to day, but for those that know that know that, uh, I'm saving them a bunch of different browser tabs or multiple applications and versioning separately. Like the one thing that anyone in this space hates with a passion is the difficulty of versioning experiments whereby you don't know if that SOP version 12.8 was used with um, you know the the EMR job 13.7 and whether it was just not updated or whether there was no update in the SOP and just tailoring all of those experiments together such that it is reproducible also is just a really hard problem. Um, yep. But with everything that I'm seeing here yeah. with the way that EMR Studio helps to log all of those jobs and the notebook versioning and um, integration with Git directly, it, it really feels like it's very thoughtful in solving that problem. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know that's that's certainly what we're what we're striving for right is to make this experience a lot easier for folks that just want to come in um run their notebooks and and get back out and like i'll point out the cluster template thing again because i just i love how easy this is to just go in here and say you know what i want to spin up this cluster template and you can even add parameters in there too and then you just hit that one button and it goes and like spins up that cluster so this matplotlib one i'm going to dive into code just for a second because it's it's friday and why not um and so this cluster template here actually comes from my own repository of EMR Studio stuff. So I've got an EMR Studio CloudFormation template here. And this matplotlib studio, this um, this brings up the entire studio environment. So it brings up the VPCs, it tags them, it brings up all the policies. But then what it does is it's also got this um, service catalog uh, part here. 
that goes to uh, my cluster, my matplotlib cluster. And this, is, this isn't very complicated. Like this is an EMR um, cloud formation template that's pretty small, but it just says, hey, go ahead, spin this cluster up, um, run an additional step to install base map, which is used for drawing maps. And then you can put um, different parameters if you want to there. So you can even say, here's a cluster template, maybe um, you know, I wanna parameterize it in some way, drop those in there. But even just kind of building this cluster template is, is pretty straightforward and it, it kind of hides a lot of the complexity. So for somebody that's coming in here and they know that they want a matplotlib cluster, they can just you know spin that up and use it. And um, you know you can figure that in a lot of different ways to spin down automatically or what have you. But yeah, just it just makes things so much easier. And you know I I like code. I've been building a Grafana dashboard for my DSL line for the past few days. But like I like not having to do it too. So <laughs> um, if I can hop in here and do some awesome analysis, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Yeah, cert certainly so. I think uh, Damon's video is a little frozen there, but one thing that this makes abundantly clear to me as well is like, uh, it sort of starts to bridge the gap between folks that perform traditionally static data analysis where they have to um, get handed or request a set of data from somewhere else in the organization, and then their result is a static report that they hand off to someone else. With the parameters function that, that uh, he was talking about before, the ability to dynamically pull in data and serve that without having to be a data engineer uh, yourself is a really powerful prospect, right? Like the ability to develop not just a system by which you generate reports, but, or rather not just the reports themselves, but a system that can automatically generate them uh, within this little uh, constrained environment is immensely valuable. Well, uh, I think Damon's internet disconnected, um, but we're gonna, Rob, do you wanna take a break or do we wanna just keep the show? Oh, I think he's back. All right, Damon, we were just asking what we were going to do at, since you dropped, <laughs> but um, everything seems to be in order now. So welcome back. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you heard me talking about how I've been mapping my DSL uh, line for the past few days, but um, that's what just happened is it dropped at the end of the show. So um, it got cloudy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that a cloud computing pun I see or just coincidence? Oh no, my terrible pun disconnected him. I'm the worst. I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> uh, he's a Starlink beta tester. <laughs> All right. Well, while we're waiting for Damon to come back with that uh, beautiful smile that we see on screen there, uh, I wish I looked that good when I disconnected from things. But, um, Chad, if you have any other questions for Damon or on EMR Studio, please get those in because um, we're nearing the end of this session here. But,. Um, Man, this is really this is really interesting. I think uh, I hinted at this, and I'll use this as an opportunity to talk to one of the questions that I saw in chat, which was um, this studio interface for EMR looking similar to things like Amazon SageMaker Studio um, or or SageMaker Notebooks. And so uh, the the fundamental technology that's used under the hood here. Sorry, I know the overlay is a little funky right now. Um, while it's just the two of us, let's see. Now this is equally as funky, but at least it's just the two of us here, Rob. Um, anyway, the underlying technology there is, is uh, Jupyter and Jupyter Lab. Um, and so uh, I, I know the service teams have, have worked extensively with that to extend that for their particular use cases. Um, but this idea of being able to have a runtime or a kernel that a, oh, I think he is back. Yeah, there we go. We're just talking about Jupyter and Jupyter Lab. Um, the idea that you can have an environment by which you can iteratively run blocks of code that have shared memory space such that I run a equals one in cell one, I can go around, do a bunch of other operations and then re-reference that variable, at least in like Python, for example, um, is really cool and is really exciting. I think the common use cases here are when you're doing something like exploratory data analysis, whether you're um, you know, trying to train a machine learning model or not, you don't wanna have to rerun your pre-processing steps or manage like writing to disk and re-importing a fresh copy of your intermediary data. So what you can do is you can have these steps um, in different cells and you can always just go back and rerun the previous step to um, you know, either revert state, depending on where you're at, um, or to, to get back to the intermediate that you wanted. And so you can um, very easily have this procedural sort of um, script that you've written without having to mess around too much with the internals of the particular language that you're, that you're trying to author code in, because the interactive kernel, the interactive environment in Jupyter makes this significantly easier. So you can, for example, install the IPython kernel um, or the runtime and run that right on your command line. You don't need the GUI if you don't want to, but 
you know, as you start per performing more and more elaborate analyses, you start to see where the, the GUI really comes to save the day. And, and Damon, you were showing a lot of that, especially with graphs and printing of tables. There's just so many quality of life benefits that you get from using something like EMR Studio here or SageMaker Studio. Yeah, and it's, it's cool too, because you can actually share um, a lot of that through GitHub, right? So you can add in your, you know, add in your code, push that up to GitHub, share it with folks. And GitHub renders um, Jupyter Notebooks natively too. So you can go in there, pop that open on GitHub. You don't even need to be running Jupyter if you're pushing it to GitHub. So pretty awesome to be able to do that. Wonderful. Well, uh, glad to have you back, but I know we're on the tail end here. I've got some asks from you, mainly from chat. Um, Tarush from Twitch wants to know, uh, is there anywhere that I can go, go for a demo or sample code for EMR and EKS? So that's one. Um, we have a community in the audience who was uh, printing out that the cluster status is one of three nodes are unhealthy. So uh, love, love those jokes, <laughs> very, very timely here. Thank, thankfully, it's a self-healing it's a, it's a self cluster, so we're, we're, we're back. Uh, not that I want to jinx it. Um, and then lastly, you showed a repo before. I, I don't remember if we were able to get that into chat, but with the ability to automatically pull in code from an example or a public GitHub repo, I think a lot of people that are interested in those examples would like to test that out on, on some of your examples. Could we get that link as well to share in chat? Yeah, there's there's a couple. So um, I've got my own personal repo. repo. It's decort slash demo code on GitHub. Um, there is also in, AW, in the AWS samples, um, repository, there is an EMR Studio samples, or sorry, in the AWS samples organization, there's an EMR Studio samples um, repository. So that's one thing. There's my demo code repository. Um, I've got a bunch of stuff in there. And in my demo code repository, I do have some EKS uh, demos too. And um, I should have uh, dropped this earlier, but a little bit of self-promotion uh, for sure. I've got a YouTube channel where I do um, EMR and EKS and EMR studio demos. And so it uh, runs through just a whole bunch of different things. I'm uploading those um, you know, a couple times a week and, and doing that. And then, um, yeah, so that, those are the, the, the three main places where you can find some, some more info on that. Um, I'd love you know, folks to subscribe to me on YouTube. Um, you know, I got a few folks on there, but I'd love more. And I'd love more ideas in terms of what would be useful to folks too, just in terms of EMR and even analytics in general. Um, and there's one final thing I'm, I'll, I'll mention too. This is in my demo code repository, um, but I've been making use of CDK a lot recently, the Cloud Development Kit to deploy all these different environments. And so I've got a sample like CDK big data stack that deploys an EMR cluster, deploys an EKS cluster, uh, deploys EMR on EKS, and even deploys EMR Studio. Um, well, there's a, I have a PR open for that right now. Um, but yeah, so I'm working on kind of putting out more examples for folks because I, that's been one of my personal challenges is you go and you try and do this stuff and there's there's just not a lot of examples out there because I think everybody ends up doing it their own way or with their own requirements. And I love examples. I think that's how I've been able to be successful in my career is um, you know, breaking my copy paste buttons. So um, I'd love to put up more examples. So if folks want some more, uh, definitely you know, let me know. Um, my goal here on, on the EMR team is to make everybody else's lives easier. So the more I can do that through videos or through sample code, please, um, yeah, just let me know. I'd love to help. Wonderful. What's the preferred method of uh, communicating? Is it uh, sending emails as GitHub issues on unrelated repositories, or should they tweet at you? Should they email you? What what what's the uh, what's the standard operating procedure for getting in contact with you and the EMR team? Um, me personally, uh, Twitter is my primary communication mechanism. Um, I've been tweeting since as long as uh, EMR was a product. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm at the court on there. So definitely reach out to me. Um, and you know, I'm checking in on YouTube comments too, or at least some of them. Um, so feel free to leave some comments there if there's things you want. But yeah, definitely Twitter is probably the best place to reach out to me. Wonderful. Well, this was uh, really, really interesting. I learned a lot of things that I would not have thought about at first glance, like the ability to have the the you know the studio be off cluster or off AWS uh, or off, rather off IAM and and with your own um, federated credentials. I think that's going to be a huge boon to a lot of organizations that have a lot of folks that 
or, or maybe data analysts that write SQL and getting them fully ramped up on AWS is, is not going to provide value to the analysis they want to do. I think it's a great example of meeting customers where they are, and I'm excited to see how customers use it. So to everyone in the audience, if you're at all interested in giving feedback or just have questions, uh, please get those into Damon. We also have those uh, specialists in the chat, but thank you so much, Damon. This was a real pleasure. Yeah, thank you all for for having me. Um, it's it's been a been a lot of fun um, outside of you know getting a little bit cloudy. But um, yeah, thank you everybody, and look forward to hearing from you. And I hope everybody has a great great day. Oh,